there's pluses and minuses for both. I mean, certainly for industry and pretty much for law enforcement and government, the risk-based approach has been working. Um, it's something which, you know, there's, there's benefits to it. There's questions that, well, hey, hey, this is not enough. We want to know exactly what to do. But when you're dealing with money launderers, when you're dealing with terrorist financiers, you know, financiers, they look at the legislation. They look at, you know, what the risk profiles are of themselves. They look at what the banks, what government is doing to try and target them, and they adapt. So, you know, the risk-based approach, yes, it's, it works uh, to a point, um, but if we became more prescriptive, maybe there'd be a bit more guidance for, for, both, for both law enforcement and in industry. However, by doing that, once again, the criminals will look at, at ways of getting around that. So, you know, I haven't, I've kind of answered that, that question in a circle, but it is a, a, a cyclic thing. Um, it certainly helps in the, in the, the risk models we have within uh, private industry um, to actually understand how the criminals work, how, where the red flags are, and you can't put those things necessarily into legislation because simply the criminals are constantly changing in how they're doing their, their operations. So yes, it helps to have the legislation to being clear, to being transparent. Uh, the interpretations, Austrac interprets things usually consistently. However, once again, there are, there are problems. You know, one manager's interpretation may be different from another's. And then, of course, then we get even to all kinds of difficulties trying to work out really which is the right, right way of go to go. The AFP may have a different perspective or the New South Wales Police on an interpretation of a piece of legislation. And then it may go to the court. As a, as a lawyer, as a barrister myself, I've been in situations where you can quite clearly see the court or the judge really hasn't understood the, the money laundering process or the legislation properly. And there's not a huge history of case law in Australia or in most parts of the world uh, that explain out the key elements of the legislation. So it's a new and changing area and also an adapting area. And because of that, it leads to a certain amount of uncertainty. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say which is the best, but I think what, if we keep on going and updating, like I mentioned before, then we can at least try to, to meet the challenge uh, of what the money launderers are putting before us. I'll stop you there. You can't outsource your responsibility. And that's the key thing which some people forget. Right? They say, all right, well, if we put someone else in charge of it, that flick passes our responsibility. It doesn't. So it's very, very key if you are going to outsource that you realise you still have the responsibility and you have the responsibility that whoever you outsource it to does the job properly. If you don't, then you're still liable. The law enforcement is still going to come after you and the regulators and you still end up in a world of hurt. Is there a difference in the quality of work being done with outsourcers, outsourcing versus in-house? Uh, I th uh, horses for courses, once again, it's difficult to say. I mean, you may outsource, you know, your, your uh, compliance function to, you know, maybe in India, as an example. And you may find they're excellent and they work very well. But you've got to keep your finger on the pulse and make sure that happens, especially if it's overseas. In Australia, you may have it in-house, but your compliance officers may be not trained properly. They may be incompetent. They may be, may be uh, over, overworked. They may, the team might be too small. I mean, this, it works both ways. The key thing is to know that whatever you decide to do, whether that be outsourcing or to have it in-house, that your people are at a competent level to do the job properly and your systems are in place to protect your organisation from money launderers and terrorist finances and other criminals if they decide to, to stick their nose in to your business and try and exploit you. Absolutely, without a doubt, compliance has to be a mindset. It's got to be something that's in, you know, built into your everyday, I guess, thought process. And when I say your, I'm talking about people within reporting entities, whether it's board members, whether it's the mailroom, it's got to be part of the mindset. Um, it's, compliance isn't about the compliance department. It's not about the risk department. Um, it's about, you know, it's everybody's responsibility. It's, it's the way to do business. And I think that is the challenge, especially, as I said before, institutions, financial institutions, they're in the business of making money. They're not in the business of being uh, regulators or, or law enforcement. That, that's not what they do. But as a compliance officer, 
that I think is a primary responsibility or part of your role. When you go up in the morning and you go to work and you're talking to your colleagues, yes, you've got to you know, keep your, sort of your eye on what they're in business for from a you know, practical, pragmatic perspective and you are in the business of making money, but as a compliance officer, you also have to get across to the people that you're dealing with every day. Again, as I said, whether it's the CEO um, or the male man, that it's everybody's business. Everyone is responsible for compliance, not just, as I said, the compliance department.